Okay. Okay. So, um, again, thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, so, uh, the last in our series of uh, uh, winter webinars um, that we're doing this year through AIM. Um, uh, today, I've invited uh, Dr. Aaron Mills from Agriculture Canada here in uh, Charlottetown to uh, share with you folks uh, some research that Aaron's been doing um, in partnership with the Potato Board uh, the last few years. So uh, a couple years, well, about three years ago now, Aaron came to me with, um, he was in charge of a long-term uh, rotation trial that's been going on at uh, Harrington for a while. Um, and he's gonna tell you a little bit more about that. Um, but it was in, uh, they were kind of looking at where that project was gonna go uh, in the future and uh, brought it to the board as uh, would we be interested in, in um, being part of that research and, and, and having some input into what type of trials or uh, what type of rotations are done there. So we, uh, we came up with a, uh, we worked together, came up with a project plan. Aaron's gonna go through that more so I won't steal his thunder, but uh, just to, to let you know, this is a, uh, an interim uh, report. Uh, we're still uh, in progress on this trial. We've got another full year of uh, rotation trial data to come this year. And then hopefully after this season by next winter, when we're able to all meet in person again, uh, we'll be able to share with you a little bit more complete and uh, final data on, on the first three years of this uh, new rotation. So with that, uh, Aaron, I'll turn it over to you and you can share your screen and, uh, and we'll get started. All right. Is that good, uh, Ryan? Yep. You can hear me okay? You sound great. Okay, cool. All right. So get on to this here. Okay. I'm getting better at this too. Okay. So presentations up there? Yep. Okay. All right, so uh, yeah, uh, thanks Ryan for uh, inviting me to be part of this, uh, this AIM series. Uh, we're just gonna kind of go through it. Uh, you know, this, like as Ryan said, uh, this is, uh, we have two years of data out of three years. So, um, you know, this is really, at this point, it's like a, a two-legged stool. So, you know, we're gonna take everything with a grain of salt. But uh, we're just going to kind of go through um, some of the history and uh, how we got to where we are now. And just to set the stage, uh, we all know that uh, crop rotation is important to um, primarily to break our uh, pest and disease cycles. Um, you know, it, it allows for efficient use of resources. Uh, different crops require different uh, nutrients out of the soil. So if you're using different crops in the rotation, then uh, you're using those resources uh, more efficiently. And uh, one of the most important reasons why we, uh, we rotate our crops is, uh, is the portfolio effect. So, you know, we, we all need a, a diverse uh, portfolio. Uh, you know, if we get uh, weather that's uh, more suited to one crop, then it'll do better than other crops and we won't have all our eggs in one basket. Unless of course we get a, a year like we had last year and, and nothing grew. So uh, what makes a, uh, a good crop rotation? So, you know, overall uh, the rotation, it, it needs to be profitable. And, um, you know, we, we achieve that profitability by uh, incorporating crops that are, that complement each other and inputs that jive with each other. So, you know, some examples would be, uh, you know, potentially some herbicide carryover, you know, that would be a bad thing. Um, a good thing is, uh, you know, an increase in the amount of uh, phosphorus that might be available after uh, growing a buckwheat crop. Um, you know, uh, following small grains uh, behind corn is, is a bad example. Um, you know, the likelihood of, uh, of disease and a reduction in grain quality uh, in your barley or wheat following corn is, uh, is bad. And also uh, sclerotinia, it's a very real problem in a lot of our main crops. And, uh, you know, this, this uh, pathogen is, has 400 different hosts. 
So it's, it's something that we have to uh, keep in mind when we're planning our, our rotation. Now, uh, I know length, uh, rotation length is a bit of a controversial um, uh, topic. And I know a lot of us have uh, been going through life hoping that, uh, you know, length is not important. But, uh, you know, honestly, I, I, I do think that uh, length is important uh, in rotations. Um, we, uh, when we look at other places uh, that are growing potatoes where they don't have the, uh, and I'll call it a luxury of a, of a hard winter to knock, knock down pests and diseases, uh, really the only uh, tool in their toolbox that they have is, is rotation. And so um, when we look at, uh, you know, warmer winters, uh, less winter kill of some of these pests and diseases, um, I think that uh, rotation is going to become more and more important for us. Uh, I just wanted to talk to talk about a bit of uh, of uh, work that we've been doing with the Atlantic Grains Council. That you know, we I, I mentioned in earlier slides. You know, those are those are more or less motherhood statements for uh, why we should rotate our crops, but. Um, I think that some of the stuff that's coming out of uh, the work from the Atlantic Grains Council kind of, uh, it really hits home uh, why rotations are so important. And um, this, is, this is brand new uh, stuff that I, I think it's only been presented a couple times uh, so far this year. It's only months old. But uh, to give you some, an idea of the Atlantic Grains Council, they've been, um, doing on-farm uh, research since 2015. Uh, they uh, leverage uh, levies that are collected uh, from the grain elevators and uh, use that to fund research. And I think the most important uh, part of the on-farm research uh, from the Atlantic Grains Council is the recognition of, uh, of the farmer as a researcher and, and their need to uh, conduct on-farm research. And uh, this is opposed to, you know, the, um, the uh, buddy down the road uh, effect, you know, a, a lot of times I'll be talking to uh, people and, you know, inevitably we'll be on some topic, whether it's, uh, you know, buckwheat or fertility or whatever, and then we'll, we'll get the buddy down the road did this and that, but, you know, just to uh, give you, you know, essentially the magic number that we need is, is 30. So, you know, we need basically 30 examples of something before we can even start to believe it. And this, this is part of the basis of all of our experimental designs and, you know, how we, we analyze things is, you know, you either need 30 sites or 30 years or, you know, a combination of both. And then you can actually start to be sure about the results that you're finding. And we've taken this approach with the Atlantic Grains Council with the on-farm research. And it's, you know, it was a kind of a rocky road at the, uh, at the beginning because uh, we weren't seeing a lot of uh, effects from the stuff that we were doing at Harrington. We tried to scale it up and, uh, you know, we're starting to, uh, to figure things out here now. So, you know, all, all said and done, uh, I think, uh, total uh, number of site years is, is just over 500 uh, since the Atlantic Grains Council started doing on-farm research. And we're just now starting to see some of those bigger trends. So I'm gonna pull out an example, uh, a rotation specific example. And honestly, um, you know, there's uh, probably, I think a, around a dozen active uh, on-farm research projects that the Atlantic Grains Council is doing right now. And uh, easily 80 to 90% of those projects uh, are showing a strong effect of rotation on, uh, on the treatments. So, uh, and in a lot of cases, the rotations are actually masking the, uh, the treatments that we're measuring. So, and this is a prime example. Um, you know, everybody knows that uh, soybean population is, uh, is important. We've tested it at Harrington. It's been tested at the AC. Uh, and everybody's looking for that for that sweet spot. And I mean, up until now, uh, a lot of what we hammered out was, you know, you're in that uh, 160 to 180,000 uh, seeds per acre. So um, 
initially this started out, I think there was three or four different uh, seed populations we we're going for. And then we expanded it out to include uh, a, a greater range. And um, uh, there's a significant amount of, of data just on this, just on soybean seeding rate. It's, uh, it's something that a lot of people uh, really want to understand. And, um, you know, when we, when we take everything, this is the relationship between uh, plant population at the bottom, and we have uh, yield on the y-axis. I mean, when we fire, this is called a lowest curve. And when we fire a curve through it, I mean, if you squint your eyes a little bit, you might be able to see a little bit of a bump here. But honestly, uh, at the end of the day, you know, um, when you look over here and, uh, you know, there's people planting at uh, 225,000 seeds per acre and Buddy down the road is at, uh, you know, 90,000 seeds per acre and he's out yielding you, uh, it doesn't, there's nothing really uh, that you can take to the bank on this. And so um, the natural uh, conclusion when we look at something like this is that, uh, you know, why would I be seeding at a higher rate um, if I can get the same yields uh, seeding at a lower rate? And so when we uh, started running these, and when I say we, I mean uh, Sherry Fillmore down in uh, Kenville. She's, uh, she's a brilliant statistician and she's, she's brought um, on-farm research uh, quite a ways uh, for the East Coast in the past five or six years. And so when we looked at how strong the uh, rotation effect was, uh, we tried to, uh, to pull it out and we found some really interesting results where um, you have the different colors here, the different, uh, different rotations, and we're looking at the uh, seed populations here again, and we're looking at the, uh, the yield, uh, seed yield, this time it's in uh, kgs per hectare. But when you look at this blue line, that is uh, potato rotation, uh, you know, guys growing potatoes can actually get away with that, that lower seeding rate. And those, um, those effects diminish in around, you know, what we thought was the ideal seeding rate. And then they improve a little bit uh, when we get up to the 225,000 seeds per acre. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, this, this is more of the curve that, that you would expect to see. And this is the one that we were focusing on uh, before when we were looking at pure grain rotation. So, you know, there's that sweet spot, 160 to 180,000 seeds per acre. And with forage, you know, the, uh, if you have a forage-based rotation, um, it's almost a linear relationship. Uh, the more you're putting in the ground, uh, the more yield you can expect to get from those. So, I mean, this is an example of, um, uh, you know, we take a lot of uh, research from other places and uh, we try to apply it to PEI. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but it's really important to, uh, to test those ideas on as many fields as we can for as long as we can to just try and figure out exactly what's going on. Um, and honestly, uh, if anything, I think the rotation effect is, is stronger in PEI than it would be in, in other places. You know, for example, uh, a lot of the seeding rate uh, stuff for soybean uh, has been done in places where they're only growing two crops, they're growing corn and soybean. So, you know, it's not, there's no complexity and uh, they can be pretty confident in their numbers. Uh, when we have a fairly diverse um, uh, number of crops that we're growing in the rotation, uh, there's a lot of different things uh, that are influencing those results. So, you know, this goes beyond the typical mother, motherhood statements about uh, rotation effects, and it actually uh, shows a rotation effect that you can base your uh, management decisions on. So um, it's important, you know, as researchers, we're recognizing the importance of, uh, of doing this uh, rotation work. And um, it's not just me, uh, Judith, um, my colleagues, Judith and Andrew, are uh, doing some really neat uh, rotation work at Harrington as well. And uh, the one that I'm going to talk about today is the, uh, the one where we're working with the PEI Potato Board. And it's uh, when you're driving down the, uh, when you're driving out to the North Shore um, on the Brackley Point Road, it's on the left. You can actually see it from the road. And uh, this is what it looks like. This is uh, 
we're actually using a, um, it's called a staggered start uh, rotation approach. And it's, it's one of the most powerful um, ways to, uh, to do rotation work because we have all crop phases uh, every year. And what we're able to do is take out the year-to-year -year variability and actually focus on the, uh, the questions that we're trying to answer. And I'll come back to this in a little bit. Uh, so it, it was started uh, back in 2005 uh, by my predecessor, uh, Kevin, Kevin Sanderson. And uh, it was initially sponsored by the um, Oxford Frozen Foods and Bragg Lumber um, with carrot as the main crop. And then uh, in 2018, um, you know, we, we figured that we took carrots uh, far enough and they're actually, a, we're not set up very well to uh, be working with carrots anyway. Um, I was interested in moving into potatoes and that's when I approached uh, Ryan and the uh, PEI potato board to get on board. Uh, this is what it looked like uh, at the very beginning, uh, back in uh, 2005, and you can see there's a Brackley Point Road uh, just in the, the other side. And this is what this is what the rotations look like. So there was three different uh, main rotations, and um, superimposed on the uh, the carrot year were six different uh, nitrogen treatments, and uh, so they were looking at. Uh, so we have carrot followed by barley and then pearl millet, which has been shown to be a non-host for, uh, for uh, certain nematodes. Uh, the second rotation was carrot, uh, barley underseed with timothy, and then the timothy the third year, and then carrot, uh, barley underseed with timothy, timothy plowdown, uh, followed by pearl millet. And a lot of different things came out of this study, but, you know, one of the biggest uh, results was that we didn't feel that uh, three years was, um, was long enough uh, for carrots. And this was reinforced by uh, talking to people in the carrot industry that uh, uh, mentioned that they preferred to grow um, carrots on, on land that had never seen carrots before. So, you know, that's, that's one of the reasons why uh, we probably saw a, a decrease in yield. But uh, one of the things that we, we noticed was that, um, or that we tried to pull out of the data was the diversity effect. And so you can see this green line, it actually has more species than the other two. And although we're seeing a general trend in a decrease of yield, uh, it wasn't as bad for, um, for the more diverse rotation than, than the less diverse rotations. So, uh, in between there, we, we stuck with the carrots. Uh, we did another uh, uh, set of rotations uh, where we basically had three crops versus many more crops. So we uh, looked at the main rotations being uh, carrot, sorry, carrot, the main crop, and either barley, timothy, or barley underseed with timothy as the second year crop. And then <clears throat> we uh, looked at a split where we're using either pearl millet, uh, homestead mix. Uh, some people might remember that as a, a commercial mix uh, off the shelf. And that what we called a homestead plus mix, which uh, included these three other uh, species um, just to increase the, the total number of species. And this is what it looked like. Um, uh, this is obviously the uh, um, the cover crop treatments, you can see the barley and the carrots over in the, the distance there. And I mean, we didn't get a huge uh, increase in yield. I mean, if anything, they, uh, they flatlined. And I think that, uh, you know, that, that was probably uh, another artifact of the, uh, the fact that, you know, three years probably isn't a uh, long enough rotation for carrots. Uh, but one of the more interesting things that came out of it was that, you know, the higher diversity, uh, rotations, we did see a, an overall and significant uh, reduction in the, the number of plant feeding nematodes, firstly, and, uh, you know, root lesion nematodes specifically. So moving out and, you know, with an, an interest to move away from carrots and into potatoes, uh, that's where I, I um, approached Ryan and the, the potato board to come up with uh, a new scheme to carry us through. Um, Initially, so we always have a, uh, because it's a staggered start, we have a uh, transition year that we call, um, it's essentially the anchor year. And uh, 
you know, the effects are based on, on what we would have seen on the previous, uh, the previous uh, um, three year period. So um, moving into it, we had potato obviously as the main crop. Uh, the second year we had uh, barley and then uh, ryegrass seeded after the barley and uh, field pea seeded up, or sorry, field pea with ryegrass seeded afterwards as our two um, cash crop rotations. And then uh, we decided to throw in a, a buckwheat brown mustard uh, combo. So um, this is uh, primarily uh, the buckwheat's grown up. We uh, disc it in and then follow it with brown mustard. Uh, I think that there probably is an option to grow the brown mustard uh, first. If you're, uh, if you're a good manager, grow the brown mustard first. You could take it off for seed and then follow it up with buckwheat and have uh, very similar effects. Now the the third year we went uh, we wanted to keep the forage uh, split and maintain the forage split. So we have um, either uh, sorghum Sudan, Sudan grass and pearl millet. Uh, we have this uh, commercial mix, which is an off the shelf. Uh, I think there's eighteen or twenty uh, different species. It's a real uh, hodgepodge of um, of uh, biodiversity in there. And um, we have what I'm calling the Barrett mix, which is uh, uh, basically uh, Ryan's idea of, um, of a mixture that, uh, you know, don't be surprised if you see this as a commercial <laughs> mixture in the future as well. But uh, anyway, this is, this is what we decided to go on uh, for the uh, transition year and for the, the three years. So uh, just to bring it all back, uh, these are our potato plots. And you can, this picture was obviously taken in the fall. You can see where we dug our uh, five meter rows. We uh, dig two five meter rows of potatoes. And uh, each one of these is the plot. Uh, this would probably be the barley. Um, this is uh, uh, buckwheat brown mustard. And this is probably the, uh, the peas before the rye, get, rye grass gets going. And uh, these are the three uh, cover crop treatments. So you can see all phases are grown uh, every year. Uh, these are just some of the, the uh, varieties. Um, we opted for uh, AAC Synergy, which is a pretty high yielding uh, malt barley variety. It doesn't cost that much more, but uh, we found that it's, uh, it yields pretty good for us. Um, we went with uh, Limerick because that's uh, what we had for peas. Uh, we probably, I uh, think we're going to switch to Razor uh, uh, this year. We're going to stick with the green peas. Um, and then, you know, the usual uh, suspects uh, all the way down. We got a, uh, a certified seed variety uh, for sorghum Sudan grass from, from Ottawa. And then, of course, the, the commercial mix. So we're measuring uh, absolutely everything we can possibly uh, measure in this. We're uh, looking at uh, yield and the uh, cover crop biomass. Uh, with the nematodes, we, uh, we do quite a bit of uh, time on the microscope, or I should say Christian Gallant does quite a bit of time on the microscope to, uh, to uh, identify everything to family. And uh, nematodes are, are honestly one of the best uh, uh, bioindicators out there, um, you know, their population, they're sensitive to management changes and, uh, you know, they can actually travel quite a ways through the season. Measure verticillium as well. And uh, we do some uh, so soil microbial community analysis, uh, which is another part of the uh, soil health equation. And of course, we're tracking the, uh, the soil nutrients. So today I'm just, you know, in the interest of time and, and just as to give you an update, I'm, I'm just looking uh, more or less at the, the nematode uh, responses so far and the, uh, the yield responses so far. So I mentioned the nematodes. Uh, we sampled them in the middle of the season. Uh, we've tried the before and after and middle, and uh, we've been doing this for years, and we found that... Uh, the middle of the season is is by far the best time for us to be uh, getting a really good idea of what's in the um, in the uh, plots, and so we tend to go uh, at flower whenever that uh, may be for the particular crop, and um, it gives us a pretty good idea of what's going on. So we sample all pro all plots every year and identify them to family, and we use this information. It's not you know uh, it's. We use it for soil health analysis under something called faunal analysis. You know, if you're interested in that, then uh, that's great. And if not, um, 
we also have the uh, the plant feeding nematode data as well. So this is the um, uh, this is actually one of the the nematodes that's not a bad guy, uh, but you know it's like any community you get bad guys and you get good guys. Everybody has a job to do, uh, but these are the bad guys, and uh, these are probably the ones that are uh, of more interest to um, to folks in the potato industry. So uh, when we look at uh, this is in the, these samples were taken in the potato year and they've been grouped based on the cover crop that they're following. So um, <clears throat> this is uh, the Barrett mix uh, and we're looking at the uh, root knot nematode, um, uh, commercial mix and uh, the sorghum sedan pearl millet. And so you can see with uh, both the Barrett mix and the commercial mix, uh, there's quite a bit of uh, year to year variability. And that's something that, um, you know, we'll be able to take care of in after we get the third year of data and uh, we can build our model around that. And, uh, you know, less, less of an influence of year on the, uh, when, when we're following uh, sorghum sedan or pearl millet. Um, this is, you know, this is the bad guy that uh, everybody's kind of focused on more. It's been implicated in the uh, potato early dying complex. Um, it's a, a generalist uh, feeder. And, um, you know, when we're looking at uh, just with our two years of data, um, both the, the Barrett mix and the uh, sorghum sedan pearl millet, um, you know, had relatively good control in the potato year. Um, the commercial mix, uh, not so much. Uh, when we move along the, uh, to the uh, cover crop biomass, um, these are just kind of mean values to give you an idea of uh, what we're looking at uh, year over year. Um, we didn't get the uh, 2020 um, uh, cover crop biomass. This is where we cut, the, uh, cut a swath, identify all the plants to uh, species and then measure the, um, the total biomass. We dry it down and measure the total biomass. So um, as you can imagine, that's definitely a summer student uh, driven work and we didn't have any summer students in 2020. So um, uh, we, we have a bit of a gap in that data but it, it shouldn't make too much of a difference. Uh, here's the pea and barley uh, yields. Um, you can see there, the peas are without a doubt, uh, these are low. Uh, we were definitely not given the peas uh, the love that they, that they needed. And um, one of the big issues with this is uh, this isn't really small plot and it's not really um, large plot. And uh, we're kind of in between. And we honestly don't do in between uh, as well as we could be doing it. And so the peas certainly didn't get the, uh, the love that they needed. And, uh, you know, barley was kind of the same way, but the 2020 numbers, uh, honestly, those are, everything went in late and there was zero water. So, you know, that's, that's basically the problem there. But again, uh, these are our year over year um, uh, data. And when we get the third year, we'll have a, uh, a better uh, understanding of, of what's going on. And here's the, uh, the potato uh, yield data. I put this at the end or I would have lost everybody, I think uh, right off the bat. So I've grouped them based on what the, uh, the cash crop was, if there was a cash crop. So blue is, um, is barley, uh, yellow is brown mustard uh, buckwheat and uh, plow down and gray is, is field pea. And so basically, I mean, it, it looks clear, I'm not gonna draw any conclusions, but it looks clear that the, the highest yields were, uh, were in the, uh, the buckwheat brown mustard um, uh, plow down. And uh, there was actually no significant difference between the uh, barley or the peas. And there was actually no significant differences between any of the uh, cover crops. So uh, these are not statistically different across there. Now, the thing that we have to uh, keep in mind here is peas are actually at a really good price right now. So that's a money-making year. 
and barley's at a half decent price. So that's a money making year. This brown mustard, um, unless you were actually harvesting the, the brown mustard, this brown mustard buckwheat year is there's not a money making year. So, you know, we're, there's a bit of a trade off there um, in terms of, you know, what we would expect to see as a yield at, at the end of three years uh, versus what the economic returns are on that. And again, I'm, I'm very cautious about these results because they're only, we're on a two-legged stool here. And, uh, you know, after next year, uh, Ryan and I are going to work to uh, uh, figure out what the uh, cost of production and, and put some numbers to this uh, for you guys. So moving forward, um, uh, actually, well, 2022 is when it's uh, going to wrap up. Uh, 2021 is our last uh, field year, and we're intending on doing a, a bit of a deep dive on the uh, on the data. Um, you know, these rotation experiments, uh, we learn a lot from the uh, from the first uh, first phase, but we really do like if we had six, it'd be that much better. And nine is is kind of honestly where we want to be without changing uh, too much up, but. You know, we'll take a look at things after uh, three years. Uh, the costs of production are, are critical in a, a study like this. And, uh, you know, to, to figure out whether this is uh, applicable to uh, use on your farm. And, uh, and we're hoping to put together a, a bit of a tech transfer package uh, based on the, the first three years of this study. So uh, in that, I'm just going to wrap it up and, and thank uh, Sylvia and Christian for the, uh, you know, the amount of work that uh, these guys do uh, herding students and looking after all the sampling. Um, you know, this being a long term rotation, we actually got the green light uh, fairly early. I mean, it was it was still late, but it was early compared to some of the other projects for 2020 uh, working under COVID restrictions. But you know, there was a, a hefty industry component to this and uh, they recognized that uh, this was a continuation of something that had been going on for a long time. So, uh, um, you know, it's basically uh, Christian and Sylvia that got it done for us in, uh, in 2020. So with that, I, I'll wrap it up and uh, take any questions. Thanks, Aaron. <laughs> um, so we have uh, definitely have time for some questions. I have a couple in the in the can already but i'll save them for uh if anybody else has any so you can if you have a question you can unmute yourself or you can raise your hand and i can unmute you or you can uh, put it in the chat um, but please feel free to ask any questions who wants to go first there's got to be some questions Okay, well, I have a question to get us started. Um, Aaron, we, uh, as you said, we're, this is sort of, it's an in-progress trial and, and we're just kind of giving a bit of an update. Uh, one question that I've had quite a bit from growers uh, when we're looking at the different forage species um, mm -hmm. is um, effect on soil-borne disease or, or soil-borne or sort of or like quality. Um, so I know one thing that you are tracking in the potatoes is, is um, scab and wireworm. Yeah. Um, so any preliminary indications on whether we see much difference there or is that, or is it kind of too early to tell? Uh, it's, it's certainly too early to, uh, to tell. Like I can comment on, uh, you know, we're not seeing a, a, a big difference. Um, between the forage mixtures, uh, like I'll call them forage mixtures, cover crops, whatever, green manures, you know, that's that's essentially what they are. Uh, we're not seeing a, a real, uh, or sorry, any difference between uh, those immediately before the uh, potato rotation, but we are seeing some differences, you know, based on barley or the brown mustard or the, uh, or the pea, but, um, you know, basically in terms of uh, the direct effects of uh, green manures or cover crops on potatoes and disease, that's not there, but we need the three-year um, data before we can, you know, have 
I, I'm just nervous to talk about any of that stuff without the, because uh, it's so important, but it's just, uh, I, I want to be sure of the numbers. Right on. Okay. But not nothing that really jumps out uh, at the moment as being overly concerning. No. No. Great. Uh, anybody else have any questions or thoughts? Good morning, Ryan. It's John Ramsey. Hi, John. Aaron, I have a question for you. I know your trial work is all based on a three-year rotation, and I know you mentioned earlier in your presentation that a longer rotation is better. Do you think that we can do what we need to do with our soil? And I know that's, that's, this is what a lot of your work is, is about on a three-year rotation and how important what we're rotating with has to do with that, or are we, are we pushed towards going to a longer rotation, maybe even a four? What's your viewpoint on that? Uh, I, I honestly, um, you know, I, I can't really speak to, like, in terms of my, my data, we don't really have a whole lot of data. We do have some information from the, um, uh, some of the organic potato work that was done, uh, where they're comparing uh, three year versus four year. And without a doubt, uh, you know, the quality and yield improved uh, with that one extra year. So that's, that's honestly the only study that, a PEI study that I know of that was a side-by-side -side comparison of three versus four year. Uh, I think moving in the direction of, um, you know, uh, maybe, like it, it, that's the whole point of this study is, you know, if we don't look at cash crops in a potato rotation, uh, what are some of the benefits that we're going to realize uh, with yield and quality at the end of those three years? So that's that brown mustard, buckwheat, and a forage, and then uh, potatoes. Is that enough to pay the bills? Like, does that increase in yield uh, justify not having a cash yeah. crop? Um, you know, the uh, in other places where there are high value crops, you know, the best land goes to that high value crop. And then most of the focus is, is building the soil up and putting in the resources for that high value, high feeding crop to get the benefits of. Um, you know, when we try and, and uh, take too much out, I think that's kind of where we're, we were starting to run into uh, some problems. And I, I think this study is, is, um, is, uh, giving us a few numbers to, to kind of, you know, start to understand uh, what's going on. Um, when I say longer is better, I'm just, I'm honestly just going by uh, other potato producing areas where they don't have winter and, and that's basically it. But I, I think we have to start thinking about that. Uh, there was a question from Jonathan in the chat, um, and it was, would, would we expect a different result if the mustard or buckwheat was harvested? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, we're working on that. Um, you know, we, uh, we did a bit of buckwheat work where we found that uh, there was no difference between uh, taking it off as seed versus disking versus flailing it in terms of uh, controlling nematodes. And we're just kind of trying to hammer that out for uh, for uh, mustard right now. And and honestly, if if we can get the benefits and get a, a crop off, then uh, that's really mm -hmm. that's really where we want to be for sure. Mm -hmm. in, in terms of getting a a uh, you know a mustard yield and a buckwheat yield um, the same year, mm -hmm. I, you'd have to be a pretty good operator. I don't think it's impossible, but I think you'd have to be a pretty good operator to, to pull that off. Um, but, uh, you know, if you started with mustard, took it to seed and I don't know if you'd have enough time to, to pull the buckwheat off as, uh, but even if you could get one, you know, if you, yeah, one, if you the could other get one's a cover, then it would be, yeah. it wouldn't be a, you know, you'd at least have some cash flow to pay for those yeah. crops. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, honestly, uh, you know, if, if we can take it off and not work the soil, then I mean, I think that 
it's it's got benefits for sure. Yeah. So we are doing we're collaborating with Dakota uh, and some potato growers on a trial uh, on, on grower trials on comparing mustard taken off versus mustard incorporated. So we had three sites last year. Uh, and uh, I think the hope is to have at least that many this year as well, um, where we're comparing, uh, you know, mustard that's actually harvested versus just uh, incorporated and then versus a like a barley check or a ryegrass check. So uh, we should have some, hopefully we'll generate some good data out of that too. Well, the thing is too with that is, uh, I mean, we, we have a company on the island that can handle mustard. The price is really good right now. And, um, you know, if like we're not in a position to be turning away <laughs> crops here right now. So, uh, you know, if it's kind of it's in our backyard and we should make the most of it. Any other questions? Don't be shy if you have one. Do I see your mic off there, Hans? Yeah, I was just trying to find where I can raise my hand. I couldn't oh, find it. You're all good. Ask away. Um, with the pea crop, uh, we've been put, putting in a fair bit of peas and then following it with mustard in the same year as a cover crop. How much of that uh, nitrogen from the pea crop would be available to the, uh, to the mustard to get it going? Like we've tried it following barley and the mustard just really wouldn't grow. Yeah. I honestly, um, from the work we've done uh, so far, we've, we've had, um, I guess, two solid studies where we're looking at, uh, you know, following crops with peas and um, like, honestly, we don't have a better crop option right now. Like peas are, are fantastic to lead something like that. Um, winter wheat, uh, you can't beat uh, uh, field peas before winter wheat. Uh, we've, we've got numbers to show that the, uh, you know, it's, it's more the timing that, uh, of getting it in, but you really don't need to be put to, putting down any, uh, any nitrogen following, uh, following the peas. Uh, the rains kind of come at the right time and uh, and deal with it. I mean, there's always the pea volunteers too that may uh, carry a little bit further. Um, the trash um, that's left over from the pea crop is, uh, you know, that's that may uh, mess things up, and you know, people have to figure out how to deal with that. But um, I think uh, peas right now are the the best uh, crop we have in terms of carryover for something in the fall. Yeah, I, that's that's kind of what we've been seeing too. Hmm. Tend to take off after the peas. Yeah, oh, big time. Like last year was a bit of a disaster because there was no rain on that mustard when we put it in after the peas. But most years we get a tremendous, tremendous mustard crop coming. Yeah. Am I on there now, Ryan? It's John Ramsey. Yep. So just a comment, I guess, on the on the mustard and we've had some experience playing with it. But the advantage of a, of a harvested mustard versus incorporating it is we found the incorporation in the middle of summer in the heat and the dry that it was reasonably destructive on soil fiber and, and soil building properties that we're trying to accomplish. And we felt maybe from that perspective, we, were, we weren't gaining any ground. So I, I see if as long as the mustard harvested has the same effect on nematodes and potentially wireworm in our area, then it will certainly be a win-win on that, on that, on, under those circumstances. Yeah, that's a good point, John. And I know um, we're doing a little bit of work uh, with AIM this year on biofumigant mustard again. Uh, it was planted last year and it's going into potatoes this year. Um, but we're hoping actually to, to seed the mustard fairly early and get it incorporated fairly early, like early uh, July, um, so that it's at a time when there's a little more moisture in the ground and there's lots of time to get a cover crop on after. Um, um, because, 
Um, we saw, I, I saw a presentation two days ago from Maine where they were looking at biofumigant mustard uh, rotations. And as long as they were following the, the, the mustard with a cover crop and that cover crop had a long time to establish, they weren't seeing a long-term decline in organic matter. Um, and they were seeing an improvement in marketable yield. Um, but I think that's important. I think it's about, uh, from what I've seen, it's, it's being able to follow it with a good, healthy cover afterwards and, and trying to incorporate mustard often in August or September, early September, uh, you know, as you say, it can be pretty dry, uh, it can be problematic, and then it can be hard to get a cover established afterwards. So, uh, so looking at, so actually being able to do mustard and harvest it, you know, if, if even if you got a, a strong percentage of the yield benefit and the quality benefit, and you get to harvest a crop, that might be, you know, a really good situation for a lot of farms. Any other questions before we wrap up? All right, hearing none and seeing no hands. Um, I want to thank you very much, Aaron, for uh, for joining us and participating and uh, answering some questions. And uh, I'm very excited to see how this progresses this year. Hopefully, uh, it will be possible for me to pop out to Harrington to actually see these trials this year um, after uh, not being able to grace uh, the farm with my presence last summer. Uh, but uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll see how things roll. And uh, we'll definitely look forward to the uh, to the trial data uh, following 2021 crop season. And hopefully we'll have a more of a story to tell uh, next winter. Right. Yeah. Thanks for uh, having me on board. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, have a great uh, rest of the week and uh, uh, we'll uh, we'll ch chat at you again soon. Thanks. Okay. All right. Bye.